beyond disciplinary society. Today's society is no longer Foucault's disciplinary world of hospitals, madhouses, prisons, barracks, and factories. It has long been replaced by another regime, namely a society of fitness studios, office towers, banks, airports, shopping malls, and genetic laboratories. 21st century society is no longer a disciplinary society, but rather an achievement society, Leistungsgesellschaft. Also, its inhabitants are no longer obedient subjects, but achievement subjects. They are entrepreneurs of themselves. The walls of disciplinary institutions, which separate the normal from the abnormal, have come to seem archaic. Foucault's analysis of power cannot account for the psychic and topological changes that occurred as disciplinary society transformed into achievement society, nor does the commonly employed concept of control society do justice to this change. It still contains too much negativity. Disciplinary society is a society of negativity. It is defined by the negativity of prohibition. The negative modal verb that governs it is may not. By the same token, the negativity of compulsion adheres to should. Achievement society, more and more, is in the process of discarding negativity. Increasing deregulation is abolishing it. Unlimited can is the positive modal verb of achievement society. Its plural form, the affirmation, yes, we can, epitomizes achievement society's positive orientation. Prohibitions, commandments, and the law are replaced by projects, initiatives, and motivation. Disciplinary society is still governed by no. Its negativity produces madmen and criminals. In contrast, achievement society creates depressives and losers. On one level, continuity holds in the paradigm shift from disciplinary society to achievement society. Clearly, the drive to maximize production inhabits the social unconscious. Beyond a certain point of productivity, disciplinary technology, or alternately, the negative scheme of prohibition, hits a limit. To heighten productivity, the paradigm of disciplination is replaced by the paradigm of achievement, or, in other words, by the positive scheme of can after a certain level of productivity obtains, the negativity of prohibition impedes further expansion. The positivity of can is much more efficient than the negativity of should. Therefore, the social unconscious switches from should to can. The achievement subject is faster and more productive than the obedient subject. However, the can does not revoke the should. The obedient subject remains disciplined. It has now completed the disciplinary stage. CAN increases the level of productivity, which is the aim of disciplinary technology, that is, the imperative of should. Where increasing productivity is concerned, no break exists between should and CAN. Continuity prevails. Alan Ehrenberg locates depression in the transition from disciplinary society to achievement society. Quote, Depression begins its ascent when the disciplinary model for behaviours the rules of authority and observance of taboos that gave social classes, as well as both sexes, a specific destiny, broke against norms that invited us to undertake personal initiative by enjoining us to be ourselves. The depressed individual is unable to measure up. He is tired of having to become himself. End quote. Problematically, however, Ehrenberg considers depression only from the perspective of the economy of the self. The social imperative only to belong to oneself makes one depressive. For Ehrenberg, depression is the pathological expression of the late modern human being's failure to become himself. Yet depression also follows from impoverished attachment, Bindungsarmut, which is a characteristic of the increasing fragmentation and atomization of life in society. Ehrenberg lends no attention to this aspect of depression, he also overlooks the systemic violence inhabiting achievement society, which provokes psychic infarctions. It is not the imperative only to belong to oneself, but the pressure to achieve that causes exhaustive depression. Seen in this light, burnout syndrome does not express the exhausted self so much as the exhausted, burnt-out soul. According to Ehrenberg, depression spreads when the commandments and prohibitions of disciplinary society yield to self-responsibility and initiative. In reality, it is not the excess of responsibility and initiative that makes one sick, 
but the imperative to achieve the new commandment of late modern labor society. Ehrenberg wrongly equates the human type of the present day with Nietzsche's sovereign man. Quote, Nietzsche's sovereign man, his own man, was becoming a mass phenomenon. There was nothing above him that could tell him who he ought to be because he was the sole owner of himself. End quote. In fact, Nietzsche would say that that human type, in the process of becoming reality en masse, is no sovereign superman, but the last man who does nothing but work. The new human type, standing exposed to excessive positivity without any defense, lacks all sovereignty. The depressive human being is an animal laborans that exploits itself, and it does so voluntarily without external constraints. It is predator and prey at once. The self, in the strong sense of the word, still represents an immunological category. However, depression eludes all immunological schemes. It erupts at the moment when the achievement subject is no longer able to be able. Nicht mehr können kann. First and foremost, depression is creative fatigue and exhausted ability. Schaffens und Konnens Mudigkeit. The complaint of the depressive individual, nothing is possible, can only occur in a society that thinks. Nothing is impossible. No longer being able to be able leads to destructive self-reproach and auto-aggression. The achievement subject finds itself fighting with itself. The depressive has been wounded by internalized war. Depression is the sickness of a society that suffers from excessive positivity. It reflects a humanity waging war on itself. The achievement subject stands free from any external instance of domination. Herrschaft instanz, forcing it to work, much less exploiting it. It is lord and master of itself. Thus, it is subject to no one, or, as the case may be, only to itself. It differs from the obedient subject on this score. However, the disappearance of domination does not entail freedom. Instead, it makes freedom and constraint coincide. Thus, the achievement subject gives itself over to compulsive freedom, that is, to the free constraint of maximizing achievement. Excess work and performance escalate into auto-exploitation. This is more efficient than allo exploitation for the feeling of freedom attends it. The exploiter is simultaneously the exploited. Perpetrator and victim can no longer be distinguished. Such self-referentiality produces a paradoxical freedom that abruptly switches over into violence because of the compulsive structures dwelling within it. The psychic indispositions of achievement society are pathological manifestations of such a paradoxical freedom.